Hello and welcome back to Fourier Transform, the video series where we talk a lot about the construction of so-called Fourier series. And in today's part 20, we will look at an interesting fact, which is known as Gibbs phenomenon. In short, it's an oscillating behavior every Fourier series has at jump points. However, as always, before we go into the details, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And you might already know, as a supporter, you have access to additional material and exclusive videos. Alright, then let's get straight to the topic of today, which is Gibbs phenomenon. So as already mentioned, this is something that only occurs at jump points, so we have to consider a non-continuous function. So this function we have already seen in part 17, and we also already know that the Fourier series converges pointwisely, except at the jump point. Because there, we already know, the Fourier series always converges to the point in the middle. And now as always, we can just increase how many terms we consider in the Fourier series, and we get a better and better approximation at every point, except at the jump point. So for example, if we go to 40 terms, we already see we are really close to our original function. However, strangely enough, this is not correct for points that are close to the jump point. There we see a big gap still. And now we might expect that this overshooting we see gets smaller and smaller when we increase our n. Therefore, let's look at a larger n here on the right hand side. For example, we could go to n is equal to 100 and then we see we have a nice pointwise convergence. But we also recognize that this overshooting is still there and it's exactly of the same amount as before. And this is what we call Gibbs phenomenon. We always have overshooting no matter how large our n is. And please note this is not a contradiction to the pointwise convergence we definitely have at all the points around the jump point because this overshoot also moves to the left or to the right here. So this means it will only vanish in the limit itself. So you can see it as an interesting mathematical fact. We have this oscillating behavior in the approximation of the Fourier series. So you can remember Gibbs phenomenon says we cannot get rid of this overshooting with a finite Fourier approximation. And we can actually prove it in general, but to keep it short, let's prove it for a given example. And I want to take a standard example of a step function, like we have it discussed in part 6 already. Well, then let's define this function f that only takes the values 1 and 0. And as you can see, this function has a negative jump at the origin, it goes from 1 to 0. And we define this function in such a way that it has a negative jump at the origin, so it goes from 1 to 0 there. And as always, defining the function from minus pi to pi is enough, because we extend it to pi periodically. And now from the pictures above, we already expect that the Fourier approximation does something like that at the origin. And here the good thing is that we don't have to calculate the Fourier series, because we have already done that in part 6. In fact, our function f is almost an odd function, it's just shifted to the top by one half. Therefore, we have the constant one half and then only signed terms in the Fourier series. Indeed, also only the odd frequencies in the signed functions are involved here. And now, of course, this Fourier series here stops at a given n and maybe to keep it simple, let's take an odd n. Obviously, then when we increase n by one, we don't change the Fourier series at all. And now let's use the sum symbol to put this Fourier series into compact form. So we could write that k goes from 1 to n, but it only covers the odd case. So maybe it's not the standard way to write a sum formula, but it keeps the formula simple in this case. Simply because now we can just write 1 over k times sine of kx. So this is the whole Fourier series, and if we can estimate the sine over k function, then we have an estimate for the overshoot. So this is the idea for the rest of the video, let's estimate this nice sum. And as I already told you, the essential part here is just the sine function of k times x divided by k. And here one idea for the estimate is to introduce an integral, 
because it's not hard to find the derivative of this function. Namely, it's simply the cosine of k times x, but now we need a different variable in the integral, so we choose t. Moreover, not so surprising, in the next step, we push the sum into the integral. So what we get inside the integral is a sum of cosine functions, and there you might remember that in part 11 we have already simplified that. However, there we didn't have this odd condition on the sum formula, therefore something will change now. Thankfully, most things still work here, and the first idea is to substitute the cosine function by exponential functions with Euler's formula. And since we get two exponential functions, one with a minus sign, one with a plus sign, we can just go with the sum from minus n to plus n. But please don't forget, we still just sum up the odd case. Okay, then quickly the next step, there we want to shift the sum by n, so now we sum from 0 to 2n. Which means inside the exponential function we have m minus n. And moreover, since m is defined as k plus n, so the addition of two odd numbers, we now sum up the even numbers. So this is important, we still have the same sum, but now we have an even index involved. Okay, then the next step, we just pull out our factor e to the power minus i n t, and then the sum with m remains. And as you might remember from part 11, this one we want to rewrite as a geometric sum. For that we have to go away from the even numbers, which means we need a new index, and we call it l, that goes from 0 to n. And then we get 2l in the exponential function, but let's write it as an exponent for that as well. And at this point we can recognize our geometric sum formula, because inside we have q to the power l. Therefore, let's apply the formula as we know it. Usually the denominator is the first thing everyone knows, because it's 1 minus this q. And indeed the numerator looks almost the same, but there we have q to the power n plus 1. So very well, now in the next step we substitute q again, and then you see we have a lot of exponential functions, which we can put together. And in fact, what you should see is that we can put them together to sine functions. Obviously we still have a fraction, and in the numerator we find the sine function of n plus 1 times t. And the denominator is much simpler, there we just have the sine of t. So there we have it, this is a nice result, instead of the sum over the cosine functions, we just have a fraction of two sine functions. However, as you might know, this does not hold in general, because in the geometric sum formula, we have to exclude the case that q is equal to 1. So for t is equal to 0 and t is equal to pi and so on, we have to exclude that case. And moreover, we also have chosen our n as an odd number. Okay, now in the next step, let's put all the formulas together and then let's form our estimate. So first what we have is that the sum over the sine functions can be written as an integral. And here we can say if we go to a positive x, we can estimate our denominator. Namely, we know that the sine function always lies under the linear function t. And since we have that in the denominator, we get an estimate in the other direction for the whole integral. In other words, we just have the sine function in the numerator divided by t. So this is what we have, and to make it even clearer, we should substitute inside the sine function. So let's say n plus 1 times t is what we call y. Then clearly we get an integral from 0 to n plus 1 times x, and inside we just have the sine function of y divided by y. And indeed, this is something you might know, this is what some people call the sinc function. And the important property here is that the sinc function has a big maximum at the origin, and then it's oscillating. This means, when we calculate the integral from 0 to 1 point on the real number line here, then we have positive parts in the integral and negative parts. So we get some cancellations, but the first part, the first positive part, is always the biggest one. This implies that the integral function we are interested in has a maximum at pi. Moreover, this whole integral function also has a common name, it's called the sine integral. And usually it's denoted by capital Si. 
and now we evaluate that at the point n plus 1 times x. So as already mentioned, the important fact we need here is that this sine integral function has a maximum at the position pi. And this immediately implies that the function we are actually interested in has a maximum at pi divided by n plus 1. Hence, exactly at this point we have the strongest estimate for our sum. And since this sum is used in our Fourier approximation, we have the estimate as wanted. More precisely, we look at our Fourier series fnf at the point pi divided by n plus 1. So you already see, the larger this n is, the closer we are at the origin. Okay, and here we already know, we have the constant 1 half minus this whole sum where the sine and the k is involved. And since we have the estimate for this sum in that direction, we get it in the other direction with the minus sign in front. So we can just write 1 half minus the constants times the sine integral at pi. This means we have minus 1 over pi times si at pi. And since this last part is just an integral, we can calculate it numerically as accurately as we want. Indeed, I write down the numerical value here because we want to have an estimate with concrete numbers. And using that we can just do the division and the subtraction and what we get is minus 0.089. So roughly we get 9% for this value. Indeed we can put it as a percentage because the original jump of our function f was given by 1. For a quick sketch here we have the value 1 and here the value 0. And now this 8.9% tells us that our Fourier series always has an overshoot of 8.9%. Simply because at this point we are always below this value no matter how large n is. So this overshoot amount always happens, the only thing that changes is the position where it happens. And you can also see that it gets closer and closer to the origin. And that's the reason why this overshoot actually vanishes in the limit n to infinity. And there we have it, this is what we call the phenomenon of Gibbs. In fact, Gibbs discovered it as a measurement error, but it's actually a mathematical fact as you have proven now. Okay, then I would say, let's meet in the next video and have a nice day. Bye bye.